Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So as the Holy Scripture says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Amen. Well, let's come to God before we look at those words. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can meet in your name. We thank you for a lovely day. But more than anything, Lord, we want to come and hear you speak to us this morning. We've just read, Lord, about hearing your voice. And that's what we've come to do. We've come to hear what you have to say to us. We've come to worship you and praise you for the grace and love you have shown us. And we can hear all about you, Lord, through your word. So help us to focus and minister on you this morning. Pray, Holy Spirit, would touch and work in every heart. Draw us closer to yourself, we pray, for the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> well, the title for our talk this morning, surprise, surprise, is taken from the first verse of our reading, uh, which says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Um, Oh, when I'd selected some quite well, good hymns leading up to this time this morning about seeing what Jesus has done for us on the cross to fix our thoughts, if you like, fix our eyes on Jesus. So that's our title for this morning. Now, I know not everybody is a fan of sport, especially when television programs seem to uh, be full of them. But this weekend, if you are someone who likes sport, then I suppose it must be a bit of a dream weekend for you in one sense. There's a few major events on at the moment. You've got football, we've got the Women's Euro 2022 tournament going. We've got golf, the Open Championship up at St Andrews in Scotland. There's actually some rugby going on, isn't there? The home countries are touring down under. I won't say any more about that one. 
And we've actually got the World Athletics Championships going on in the USA as well at this moment. So if you're a sports fan, then you should be having your cup of tea, feet up, watching TV or whatever. But I'm now going to state the obvious regarding sport. It doesn't matter which sport you follow or participate in, if you want to be any good at it, you need to train. That's taken as red, really, isn't it? And if you want to reach a good standard or a high standard, you need to persevere in your training. And you don't stop, you don't give up if something like bad weather comes along, for example. You persevere, you keep going. You don't give up when it gets hard. <clears throat> you certainly wouldn't say to yourself, oh, I'll just settle for an easier sort of training routine, because that means you'll probably fail to reach your required standard. You persevere. If you're training for an event, for a sport, you persevere. You don't give up. Giving up just doesn't make sense if you want to reach a particular level. And the same applies to being a Christian, doesn't it? If I call myself a Christian, but I don't really follow Jesus Christ, I only follow him perhaps when it suits me, when it fits in with my routine, when it fits in with my life, when it doesn't get too hard, it's not very costly for me, that's when I'll follow Jesus. But again, it doesn't make sense, does it? Because Christianity revolves around Jesus Christ. That's why it's called Christianity. It revolves around Jesus. Christianity without Jesus, without Christ, is really a total waste of time. And that's what our letter to the Hebrews is, is about. It's about encouraging believers to persevere in tough times, not to give up. It's written to help them, and it's written to help us to consider Jesus, putting him first in our lives. And we're currently, as you can guess, going through the letter to the Hebrews, um, but I think the, la the last time we looked at it was about three weeks ago. So I'm going to give you a quick recap just to get the, uh, the old grey cells uh, going. I think what, what was explained was this letter, though we don't know for sure, but it was probably written to Jewish believers suffering persecution, and it could well have been in Rome. And what they need is encouragement to faithfully persevere in following Jesus. In chapter 1, a few weeks ago, we saw that Jesus is God's Son. He was called the radiance of God's glory that made Jesus uh, that Jesus made and sustains the world. We see that in the first verse of chapter 1. It says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. So that's the introduction to who Jesus is, God's Son, and then it went on to compare Jesus uh, in the same chapter, saying he is superior to angels. Uh, we read this in verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. So it started by telling us Jesus is God's son, Jesus is greater than all the angels. And then in chapter 2 we read this, um, in verse 17 of chapter 2, where Jesus becomes fully human. Uh, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." So this has been covered in our first two or three sessions. We can find them online if you wish to go back and listen to them. So we've been encouraged so far to consider Jesus, as we said, as God's son. He's superior to the angels and he's become fully human. But today in our reading, this time, we're encouraged to fix our thoughts on him, 
by seeing that he's more worthy, uh, worthy rather, of more glory than Moses. And this is uh, how it opened again. If you've got your Bible in front of you, uh, the first, verse, first couple of verses in chapter 3, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Who share in the heavenly calling. That's a nice little phrase. Uh, I don't think we use it very much, heavenly calling. Because as Christians, we are people who have heard and believed a heavenly calling. Heavenly because it comes from heaven, it comes from God. And it's a heavenly calling. Because a calling is an invitation, isn't it? It invites us and leads us back to heaven, back to God. So we, if we trust as, uh, in God as a Christian, we have shared in this heavenly calling. But as we said, in this chapter, the writer of Hebrews, we're not sure who it is, uh, is comparing Jesus to Moses. And we see that uh, in verse 2. We read this in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2. He, that's Jesus, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house it itself. So you might be thinking there, okay, we know Jesus is God's son, we know he's greater than angels, he's fully human, why do we have to compare him to Moses? Well, we've got to remember that this letter is written to Jewish believers, and to Jewish people, Moses would have been their, if you like, their greatest leader, their greatest saviour. Moses, he was the one who God spoke to through a burning bush. He's the one that God gave his name to, God's name. I am who I am. Moses is the one that God called to lead Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Moses is the one God instructed, gave the instructions for the first Passover. Moses was the one who led Israel through the Red Sea. He was the one who gave, God gave the Ten Commandments to on Mount Sinai. Instructions for building the tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant, and so on. So to Jewish people, they would have been taught all about Moses. Judaism was based on what God taught the people through Moses. And to show that Jesus is, more, is worthy of greater glory than Moses, well, to Jewish believers, that would have been uh, very significant. As we said, this letter was probably, or the writer of the letter was probably concerned that Jewish believers, when they're facing persecution, may well be tempted to go back to their old belief, their old religion of Judaism, just going back to what God had taught them through Moses. They are finding it, as we read through it, more and more difficult, more and more costly to obey everything that Jesus commanded them to do. There would have been temptation to compromise, temptations to lie low, Temptations even to give up under persecution. And really, 2,000 years later, things haven't changed, have they? We are now living in a society where it's getting harder and harder, more and more costly to stand up for Jesus, to obey his commands. It's so easy to stay quiet, easy to compromise, and it's easy, sadly, just to give up. And that's why this, the, letter, the writer of this letter is urging believers to focus on Jesus by reminding them of who he is. And we too, don't we? We too need constant reminding of who Jesus is. As we were saying earlier, a Christian faith without Jesus is... <laughs> I've got it down here, as a Welsh-speaking person might say, tup, because that's what it is, tup, daft, doesn't make sense. A Christian faith without Jesus is just tup, daft. 
He can use that word if you like. So comparing Jesus to Moses would mean a great deal to Jewish people. And saying that Jesus is greater than Moses, well, that's, that's really what, what um, the writer is getting at here. And there's two ways he mentions. The writer mentions two ways uh, that Jesus is superior to Moses. In verse 2, verse 2 tells us that both Jesus and Moses were faithful in God's house. And God's house, we know, is a picture of God's people. We see that in verse 6. And verse 2 said this, He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So both were faithful, but, faith, but Moses was faithful as a servant. We see that in verse 5. It says, Moses was a faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. So Moses is a servant in God's house, but Jesus was faithful as God's son. That's what we read in verse 6. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if we indeed hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So, as a servant, Moses would bear witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. That's what we saw in verse 5. And if Jesus was the same kind of servant, then he too would bear witness to what was to come. But we were told in, back in chapter 1 that Jesus is God's final word. That's what we saw. Jesus is God's final word. So he, he's, a, he's a, um, superior to Moses in that Moses was a faithful servant, but Jesus is God's faithful son. That's the first way that the, the writer puts, uh, illustrates it. And the second way, that Jesus is greater than Moses, he is worthy of more glory than Moses. Uh, why does he get more glory? Because, as we read, Moses was a faithful servant in God's house, but Jesus is the builder of the house. We see that in verses 3 and 4. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. And we know Jesus is God. We've already seen that back in chapter 1. See, the builder gets more honour than the house itself. If you look at a house, you know someone built it, you know someone designed it. The more impressive a house looks, the greater the praise goes to the designer. A great house means a great designer. And verse 6 reminds us that we are God's house. And when I th read that, I thought, now there's a challenge for each one of us. When people look at us as God's house, do they see the designer? Does God get the glory he deserves? Does Jesus get the glory he deserves? When people look at us as God's house, do they see the designer? That's what this is getting at here. We are the house of God today, aren't we? We are the household of God. We are the ones who have received that heavenly calling we mentioned at the beginning. So, both are faithful servants, but Moses is in God's house while Jesus built the house. And this is to show how superior Jesus is as God's son. So those were the two ways that the writer here was illustrating to the Jewish believers the superiority of Jesus over Moses. But notice how this section ends. If you've got your Bibles in front of it, the end of verse 6 says this, and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. There's an if in there. If is a condition. If. If what? 
What's going on here? If we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. We are God's house if. Now this assumes that the people were believers, not that they will become believers. We are his house, is what it tells us in verse 6. And back in verse 1, it says, we share in the heavenly calling. These are believers to start with. This is nothing to do with losing your salvation. And we know, we know that, because Jesus has reminded us back in John chapter 10, verse 28, we read this. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. In other words, those who are truly saved are truly saved. You cannot lose your salvation if you are truly saved. So what we've got here in this reading is evidence of their salvation. The if coming up that we've read about, the if means if you do share in the heavenly calling, you are the household of God. That's the evidence is that you are is your persevering confidence and hope in God to the end. We see a similar thing in verse 14. It says, we, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. I think it's important wording here, isn't it? It shows if you are a genuine Christian, you're on the right track if you hold your conviction, if you're persevering. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. It's quite an important understanding there. What it isn't, it doesn't say hold on to your original conviction in order to become, in the future, sharing in Christ. But it's hold on your original conviction in order to show, to prove, to demonstrate. It's the evidence that you are sharing in Christ. Overemphasizing there, but that's very important to realize. See, the writer doesn't believe you can truly share in Christ, share in his heavenly calling, be part of his house, and then lose your salvation. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't believe that. So you might be thinking, well, what's, what's the conclusion then if we do not hold fast our original conviction? Well, the answer is we have not shared in that heavenly calling. We're not truly saved if we are not holding fast. Not holding fast to our original conviction does not make us lose our salvation. It shows we didn't have it in the first place. That's the idea here. We're not losing our salvation. We didn't have it in the first place. And that's why now comes the warning. <clears throat> and this is why the writer is giving them a warning. And in this warning, he takes them back to the time Israel were in the desert after coming out of Egypt. He quotes from verse 95, which Ruth read to us earlier. And we find that some of the parts in Psalm 95, it started like this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. The people singing this psalm believe God is their saviour, the rock of their salvation. And in verse 7, the psalm said, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care, referring to God as their shepherd. So they're praising God because he is their saviour, and praising God because he is their shepherd. And even in the psalm there comes the warning. I just as a little point uh, to mention, um, in, Hebrews chapter three, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. But in the actual psalm, it says, Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness. You might be thinking, what's going on? 
Well, just to mention the, the, the original psalm, Psalm 95 is referring to a, an event in Exodus chapter 17, at the beginning of that chapter, where the people, having been led out of Egypt, were making their way across the desert, and uh, they came to a place called Meribah and Massa, and uh, they grumbled. That was the problem, because there was no water. And after all they'd seen God doing, they didn't trust God to provide for them. God did provide when Moses, he told Moses to strike the rock with his staff and water was provided for them. But the problem was, even after everything God had done, they grumbled and didn't trust God. That's what the re reference there to Meribah and to the rebellion is in our reading. So it's a warning, a warning, because there will be those who have hardened their hearts towards God. See, the Israelites, they had been treated with great love and mercy as God brought them out of Egypt. If you know the stories of the amazing plagues that took place, Passover took place, God had shown amazing signs, crossing the Red Sea, and they'd all seen it, they'd all been witnesses to the wonders that God had showed them. And as they were going out of Egypt, they were very, very happy, keen to follow God, follow Moses as he led them. But sadly, it didn't last. And that's why this example is such an important one to, uh, to the Jewish people. The writer is encouraging them. He says he wants professing Christians to last, to persevere. Don't give up. Because that's the only way they will prove that they are truly God's people, truly God's house, truly share in Christ's salvation, to persevere. He says, look at Israel and don't be like them. So from verse 7 in our reading, we see they hear God's voice, and as we've just said, they've seen his signs, his wonders, the amazing things he's done. He's seen the plagues, the Passover, crossing the Red Sea. They've seen the water coming from rocks. They've seen the manna. They've seen the quail. But they still, some of them, a lot of them didn't believe. Verse 8, it says, Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. During the time of testing in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did, they'd been witnesses, they'd seen what God had done. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. They were there. They saw it all, yet they have not known God's ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So in other words, they had seen God's gracious works. They had seen all these signs, these miracles, these wonderful things. They had tasted the heavenly gift. But instead of trusting God when the time uh, became difficult, they simply became hard and unbelieving and did not trust God's goodness. They simply grumbled. And the result was God was angry with them and cut them off from the promised land. Now that story of Israel here is a warning to the Christians, Jewish Christians, the writer is writing this letter to. And so it's also a warning to us today. What it's saying is, and for us, don't treat God with contempt really, you know, there was wanting all the good things from God, but treating our daily walk with the Lord very lightly. Assuming God will look on us pleasantly with favor because we think we live a good life, whatever that means. But we're really only living for ourselves. We mustn't treat God with contempt. Everyone here this morning, everyone if you're listening as well, Everyone is mentioned in this passage because there's only two groups of people. Either you have heard God's voice and your heart has responded by trusting him or you've heard his voice and your heart has been hardened. You have said, 
no thank you, I'm going my way. This is what happens when you turn away from God. Your heart hardens. That's what we read in verses 7 and 8. They had seen everything, experienced God's amazing mercy, but in their hearts they had turned away from God. Sadly, there were people who were not holding on, so to speak, in Moses' time. There were those who trusted God in Moses' day, but there were many that did not. And both groups had seen God at work. Both had heard God's commands. And the writer of the Hebrews, the letter is probably addressed to, again, to two groups of people. There would have been those in the fellowship that this letter is written to who had not yet given their lives to Jesus. But there are both groups here this morning as well. There are those here who have heard God's voice and have trusted in Jesus. But there are some here this morning who have heard God's voice and have not trusted. Both groups have heard God speaking. That's the warning. So how do we respond to this warning? What does the writer to the Hebrews encourage the believers to do? Well, verse 13 points us in the right direction. It says, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. Now is the time to do it, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, when I read this, I mean, we've read this before, but again, those two words jumped out at me. Sin's deceitfulness. When we mention sin, we, all, we usually mention sin as things we do wrong, naughty things, bad things. But this is referring to sin's deceitfulness, deceit. Sin, not just being something that we do wrong, but it's working in our hearts and minds to make us think things which are wrong. Perhaps they make us believe things are right, believe things are okay when they're not, when they're wrong. There could be people here this morning who think they're okay with God, but in fact they're not. That's sin's deceitfulness. Jesus told a parable about ten bridesmaids won't go through it all now. It's in Matthew chapter 25. You can read it for yourself, Matthew chapter 25. There were ten bridesmaids ready for the wedding. All ten expected to go into the wedding feast. All ten looked the same. But only five were admitted. Isn't there? There are people who think they're okay. That is sin's deceitfulness. It's nothing, oh, I'm not a bad person, I'm okay. Sin's deceitfulness. It makes you think you're okay. Question is, where are, where are you this morning? Sin is deceitful. I'm emphasizing that because it's so true. Charles Colson, founder of Prison Fellowship, he said this quote uh, back in 1974. If there is anything worse than our sins, it's our infinite capacity to rationalize it away. In other words, sin can be, if you like, small steps. They creep up on us without us realizing it. But what we do is make excuses, rationalize it away. We can justify, do we justify not coming to church? We, made an ex we make excuses why we can't come when they're not really true. Do we justify missing our daily time with the Lord, with Jesus, when we could do it quite easily? And we had to read the newspapers, didn't we? Have to watch that television program. Do we justify missing our time with Jesus? Do we justify not praying? Do we justify going somewhere when we shouldn't? Do we justify our ungodly reaction to certain situations? Oh, they were so, I was so angry, I... Do we keep finding excuses? 
could go on and on. I think you get, I think you get the picture. It's sin's deceitfulness. Sin is deceitful. It makes us think we're okay. It makes us put excuses in the way. So we think we're doing okay. Is this what verse 12 in our reading was referring to? Verse 12 said this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Has sin deceived people into believing they're okay? Well, you could be thinking now, well, how do I know if I'm okay? Well, verses 6 and 14 give us the answer here. Verse 6 says this, But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. Here he comes. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Verse 14, similar. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, to the Jews who had believed in him, it'll come up on the screen, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hold on. Hold firmly, perseverance, perseverance in opposition, trusting in Jesus when things don't go according to plan. Not like the Israelites back in Moses' day. Persevering faith is a mark of true conversion. That's what we're being told here. Persevering faith. <clears throat> you might think, well, does that concern you? Do you persevere when things are difficult? when you don't know which direction to go, when things are not clear? Do you give up when things get tough in your faith? We are to be aware of the, the reality of deceitful sin. As I say, it's not just a case of doing bad things. Sin deceives us. That's why in verse 13, the writer tells us to encourage one another. William Bridge, back in the 1600s, said this. He was an English independent minister, but he says a godly person moans, mourns for another's sin as well as for their own, because they mourn for sin as sin. They mourn for another sin. In other words, that's why we are to encourage each other daily. There are too many people who think they live a good life, so God will be happy with them. And you have to ask yourself the question, why would God send his own son, Jesus, to die that cruel death on a cross if we could please God by living what we would call a good life? Jesus came for a particular reason. Sin is deceitful. Sin has to be dealt with. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he died on the cross. The punishment for our sin, for my sin, it was dealt with for your sin. The price of my sin, the price of your sin was paid with Jesus' own life. But we have a heavenly calling. Jesus is a living saviour and he's calling you. Death couldn't hold him. There is an eternal inheritance to be had. You see, if there is no eternity, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, if he's not our living saviour, then what we're doing here today is a complete waste of time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. The question is, where, what place does Jesus have in your heart, in your life? Or are you still living in rebellion against God? See, many, many make a start with God. The parable of the sower explains a lot about this. Many make a start with God. They hear their sins can be forgiven. They hear that they can escape hell and go to heaven. Or some simply follow in family footsteps. Everybody in the family gets, becomes a Christian. They think, they believe, 
And then perhaps in a week or a month or a year or even 10 years, testing comes. A bit like the Israelites. No water in the wilderness. They're bored with the manna. There's a growing craving for the pleasures of Egypt. Does that apply to anyone here? It's a dangerous condition to be in. To find yourself no longer interested in Jesus and his word and living for the glory of God. When you thought you did, remember this is for people who thought they were okay. They had heard his voice. All you're interested in are perhaps the fleeting pleasures, and they are fleeting, of what this world can offer. They seem more attractive than Jesus. Don't let sin deceive you. Deceive you in thinking you're okay, that Jesus doesn't really matter. You just live the way you want to. God will understand. Verses 18 and 19, to close of our reading, says this, And whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? As Ruth said earlier, this doesn't end well, does it? It's a warning. To whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. If you harden your heart, it means you don't believe. Don't let sin deceive you into thinking you do when you don't persevere, when you don't really put Jesus first in your life. You've heard his voice. Don't harden your heart. Don't turn your back on Jesus. Final slide. Jesus is God's final word. There's nothing else to come. If you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe. And if you want to share in the heavenly calling, as our first verse said, then fix your thoughts on Jesus. And that's my prayer for everybody here this morning and listening. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Amen.